Ken Landa, thanks for watching. Let's talk about propranolol. Propranolol came on the market as Indorol. That was an immediate release form. Then it came on as a delayed release form, Inopran. It's a beta blocker. Beta blocker used for a variety of heart-related issues for blood pressure control. It was patented in 1962, approved in 1964 by the Food and Drug Administration. And even though it's an old drug, it's still the 41st most commonly prescribed medicine in America, with more than 18 million prescriptions written each year. Comes in a variety of different dosages, so you can take the appropriate amount. Since it came on the market, a variety of other beta blockers have come on the market and stolen its thunder. So now we have Lopressor or Toprol, Metoprolol. We have Atenolol or Tenormin. We have Betapace. We have Bestolic. We have Corgard. Some of these are even better sellers. So if we look at the most popular medicines in America, the sixth most frequently prescribed drug is Metoprolol. 68 million prescriptions each year. And Carvedilol and Atenolol all have more prescriptions than the propranolol. Well, the original indications for propranolol were for high blood pressure control, used either alone or in combination with other medicines, was not able to be used for hypertensive emergencies, could be used for angina, people who had chest pain when they walked a little bit. Well, they could walk a little bit further if they were taking the propranolol. It seemed that propranolol could reduce the likelihood of cardiovascular death in people who had suffered from a heart attack if it was begun within 5 to 21 days after the heart attack. It could control the heart rate in atrial fibrillation, didn't make you get back to normal sinus rhythm, but could control the ventricular response. It could be used for migraine prophylaxis, prevention of migraine headaches not the treatment of, but the prevention of migraine headaches, and also seemed to find use in essential tremor. Off-label, it was used in people who were hyperthyroid or thyrotoxic and had a high ventricular rate, so it managed the heart rate for those individuals. Performance anxiety in musicians and actors and public speakers is an issue, and it seems that propranolol could keep the heart rate down, and up to about 25% of those individuals take medicines like this. It was used for proliferating capillary hemangiomas in newborn infants. It was used as a performance-enhancing drug in those sports that required high degree of accuracy, like shooting and archery, used in people with cirrhosis to prevent esophageal bleeding from the dilated veins at the bottom of the esophagus, used in people who had aggressive behavior after brain injuries, other indications were sometimes for prevention of cluster headaches, hyperhidrosis, excessive sweating, control in glaucoma, although not a first choice, of course, but it does lower the intraocular pressure and can be used for post-traumatic stress disorder because it seems to alter the consolidation of those negative memories. Well, additionally, it's been studied for specific phobias. So if people, for instance, who are afraid to go to the dentist, or people who are afraid of certain insects seems to be helpful. But on the other hand, if you happen to have bronchial asthma or you already have a slow heart rate, this drug is not for you. It's not for most people who have heart failure or people, obviously, who are hypersensitive to the drug or people who have toxicity from taking too much cocaine. Also, it seems that you shouldn't stop the medicine abruptly. Because if you happen to have coronary artery disease, and you don't even know you have coronary artery disease, well, if you stop the medicine abruptly, it might lead to an increased incidence of angina or a heart attack. So if you want to stop the medicine, you do it slowly. And some people develop a hypersensitivity reaction to the medicine. You'll know that. And fortunately, it's relatively rare, so that's not a big issue. Well... There is an issue with heart failure. A lot of people have heart failure, unfortunately, maybe after a heart attack or for a variety of other reasons, and it seems that beta blockers might reduce the sympathetic stimulation, the adrenaline or the noradrenaline that the heart needs. So it might worsen congestive heart failure. And people who happen to have asthma or who have any bronchospastic lung disorder, even chronic bronchitis, then those individuals might be at a little increased risk. 
And also, if you happen to have a slow heart rate, and you take this with another beta blocker, or with a calcium blocker like diltiazem or verapamil, or you're taking digitalis or even clonidine, that might lead to problems. And if you happen to be diabetic, it can reduce the awareness of the warning symptoms of hypoglycemia. So it could be relatively dangerous if you're a diabetic and if you happen to have these issues with a hypoglycemia. And people who have an increased thyroid but don't even know it, they're taking the beta blocker, everything is good, and they stop the beta blocker. Well, if they have developed worsening of the thyroid issue, that might become apparent and the person can have very rapid heart rate and have some angina or even a heart attack afterwards. So problem. There's another condition, a heart condition known as Wolf-Parkinson-White WPW syndrome. Probably not appropriate to take the medicine with that. So when we look at the medicine, it's not good if you already have a slow heart rate. It's going to slow your heart rate even more. Not good if you have bronchial asthma, if you have diabetes, got to be extra careful, hyperthyroidism. Peripheral arterial disease, if you have narrowing of the vessels going to your limbs, you have to be careful of this drug. And if you have myasthenia gravis, an issue is certainly possible. It can lead to a decrease in the intraocular pressure that I mentioned, but that means that when you go to see your eye doctor and get your eye screen for glaucoma, it might give a false low reading. So it might say everything is fine when indeed it's not. And if you happen to be taking the drug and you're subject to anaphylactic reactions for whatever reason, maybe because of a bee sting or maybe because of certain foods or nuts, well, if you're taking the beta blocker, then the epinephrine injection isn't going to work as well. Something to be aware of. Now, if you have high blood pressure, high blood pressure can be treated not only with a pill, but most appropriately with weight control, with diet, with exercise, getting off the cigarettes, controlling your blood lipids, and consuming a low-salt diet. Then you add a blood pressure medicine if you need it. Well, it seems that certain individuals don't seem to respond very well to the beta blockers. And American, African Americans tend not to respond nearly as well as the Caucasian population. But if the African American individual takes a beta blocker and a diuretic, then it seems that eliminates the racial disparity. On the other hand, there are better drugs to take because a person wants more out of treating the high blood pressure than just simply reducing the number. What you want to do is you want to reduce the likelihood that you're going to have a coronary event, a cardiovascular event. And it seems like the ACE inhibitors or the angiotensin receptor blockers or the calcium blockers or even a diuretic might be a better choice for blood pressure control. And as a matter of fact, at least in the European countries, UK for instance, they downgraded the beta blockers, they have downgraded propranolol to fourth line drug, not recommended anymore here in the United States, it's first line drug by the Joint National Commission because they said that look, if you take the drug and we look overall over a period of time, might actually be associated with an increased death rate from cardiovascular disease and increased incidence of heart attack and stroke. So, especially since the drug doesn't seem to work as well in African Americans, doesn't seem to work as well in elderly individuals, might promote the development of diabetes in some individuals. If you're going to take it for high blood pressure control, better maybe consider taking the metoprolol or the bisoprolol or the carvedilol. Also, other beta blockers seem to work a little bit better. As far as atrial fibrillation is concerned, the drugs are accepted by the American College of Cardiology, but they say, you know, again, the atenolol or the metoprolol or the carvedilol might be better choices. And as far as the rate control, if a person has atrial fibrillation, seems like it's first-line drug as far as the rate control is concerned. But again, we've gone from a predominance of the propranolol now to the bisoprolol or the metoprolol, they might be actually the first choice. And as far as angina is concerned, there's no evidence that any of the beta blockers necessarily is any better than any of the others. Doctor's choice, patient's choice on the basis of side effects. If we look at heart attacks, after a heart attack, well, there were some big studies 
done many years ago, and they showed that if you started taking a beta blocker, propranolol, if you started taking the drug between 5 and 21 days after a heart attack and continued for at least three years, it might decrease the mortality by a significant amount. The cardiovascular mortality and the all-cause mortality decreased by about 40% within the first year and decreased by about 25% after about two years. Well, that was pretty doggone significant. It seems that it prevents some of the dysplastic remodeling of the ventricle. So there are guidelines to take the beta blockers, but they don't say which beta blocker, but most people are now opting for carvedilol or the Z-beta or the metoprolol. And you continue the drug for at least 6 to 12 months if you've had heart surgery. If you haven't heart, had heart surgery, we'll consider taking it even longer. Well, there's a issue, and the issue happens to be that the old drugs don't seem to work nearly as well as the new drugs. So if we're talking about taking propranolol, which is a non-selective beta blocker, it works not only in the heart, but it also works in the lung. So we now have these cardioselective beta blockers that just concentrate their activity in the heart, and that means they don't have some of the other side effects that are associated with the non-specific beta blockers. So again, we've had a switch away from drugs like propranolol. If a person happens to have chronic obstructive lung disease, does it mean you can't take the drug? No, you can take the drug, but again, it can probably be a better choice if we use a beta-1 selective drug. If we talk about migraine headaches, well, we can reduce the incidence of migraine headaches by about one and a half headaches a month, which might be in line with some of the newer, more fancier, much more expensive medicines, hemangiomas in children, newborns. Well, they're present at birth. They grow very rapidly over the course of the first three or four months. Then they stay stable, resolve over a couple of years. But sometimes they're in very inappropriate areas, like around the eye or around the nose, cause some disfiguring, disfigurement. Well, then in those individuals, it seems like the propranolol might be very good. How does the drug work? Well, it decreases the heart rate, it decreases the force of contraction of the heart, and seems to be associated with some vasodilation, but it crosses into the blood-brain barrier, through the blood-brain barrier into the brain, and as a result, it might lead to some mental fogginess. Well, as an antihypertensive, how does it work? It works because it slows the cardiac output, slows the heart rate, decreases the force of contraction, and by doing all of that, it seems that it requires less oxygen to be pumped through maybe narrowed arteries, so that's all very good. Side effects, a fair number, nausea, vomiting, constipation, abdominal cramps, lightheadedness, decrease in the mental sharpness. Sometimes people complain of weakness or insomnia. There's bronchospasm if you happen to be prone to asthma. It may lead to impotence or an erectile dysfunction, as we now call it. Cold hands and feet can lead to some weight gain. Might lead to excessive decrease in the heart rate or in the blood pressure. That might be an issue. Sometimes it can precipitate congestive heart failure, can lower your intraocular pressure. If you have cold extremities and you're taking a non-selective beta blocker, you could take a cardioselective beta blocker. Or you could switch to a calcium blocker like amlodipine. And you could switch to a water-soluble beta blocker that doesn't cross into the blood-brain barrier. So you could take a tenolol or natolol. And maybe that's going to help if you happen to take the propranolol and suffer from sleep disturbances or vivid dreams or you have malaise or rarely develop hallucinations, could overdose on the medicine, but if you overdose on the medicine, it might require some in-hospital, very fancy medicines to save your life. If you have kidney disorder and you have kidney impairment, it might increase the concentration of the propranolol in your system by about two or three-fold. Same thing with hepatic impairment, and that's very important because the drug's metabolized in the liver, so it might increase the concentration by about three-fold. 
to not only does it increase the concentration, but it also keeps the drug in the system longer. So if we look at somebody who had cirrhosis, going to have a half-life of about 11 hours versus four or five hours in somebody who doesn't, can interact with a variety of drugs, with amiodarone, with cimetidine, with Prozac or Paxil, can interact with Cipro, can interact with diltiazem or verapamil. And if you happen to be taking a drug like rifampin or dilantin or you drink alcohol, well, that might increase the metabolism and decrease the amount in your system. And if you're a cigarette smoker, you can have about an 80% reduction in the amount that happens to be in your system. Then it won't work. You have to be careful if you're taking a drug like warfarin. If you're pregnant, that's probably not a good choice because it could lead to premature birth. It could lead to some heart and lung complications in the newborn. If you're nursing, it doesn't seem to be much of an issue. The American Academy of Pediatrics says it's safe. Well, once you take the drug, you have almost complete absorption, but it goes to the liver directly and it's metabolized very quickly. So only about 25% of the dose is going to reach the systemic circulation. But if you take it with a high protein meal, you can boost that to about 50%. The peak concentration is going to be after about one to four hours. About 90% is going to be bound to protein in the system. Going to have a half-life of somewhere between three and six hours, unless you take the extended release form. Then you take it, it's going to be available throughout the rest of the day. You have to be a little bit careful. It doesn't seem to work nearly as well in African Americans as it does in Caucasians. But if you happen to be Chinese, then it seems that you have a much higher concentration, so you need a lower dose. Now, the whole story of the beta blockers goes way back to a British scientist in the 1960s who won a Nobel Prize. He discovered the family in the 1960s, got the Nobel Prize in 1988. That was the first beta blocker that was used for coronary artery disease and for hypertension. And the good news about the whole family is that because it's been around for a while, the drugs are very inexpensive. So you get the immediate release propranolol, get 60 of the 40 milligram sort, by well, the price will be about $40 if you happen to pay cash. If you get a coupon from GoodRx, it could be as low as $20. And if you want the extended release, because you don't want to take it three or four times a day, you could get 30 of the 60 milligram pills you could get them for about $60 cash or about $20 if you have a coupon. But if you want the name brand, go figure this one. The name brand for the extended release, the Interpran, about $2,000. Or you could get the generic for $22. Bucks. Doesn't make any sense. So that's the story with propranolol. It was the first member of the beta blocker family. It's nonspecific in its activity, so it works on the heart and the lungs. And it gets into the brain, so that can cause some other kind of side effects. But overall, the medicine's kind of like the iPhone. If you look at the first iPhone or the first desktop computer, it's a great advance at the time, but over the number of years, we've had newer iPhones and we've had newer desktop computers that seem to be a heck of a lot better in the same way with propranolol. It was great when it came out, but now for the most part, we have better choices. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend, consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.